Hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Let's get started. Today's presentation is using the dot product scanner with Rhinoceros. I am Mary Figier with Robert McNeil and Associates. Our presenters are Chris Ahern and Alex Lorman. Chris is the marketing manager of Dot Product LLC. Chris will give us an introduction to the Dot Product kit. The Dot Product software turns an Android tablet into a portable real time 3D capture device. Alex Lorman is the Chief Technology Officer of C Machines. Alex is a Rhino and Flamingo expert. C Machines produces systems and upgrade kits for autonomous surface vessels. Alex will show us the ease of capturing as built 3D data with the DOT product DPI 8 kit. The scanned data will then be imported into Rhino for part design and for analysis after fabrication. And I'm Mary Fugier again with Robert McNeil, and I will be facilitating today's presentation. Okay, the presentation will take about an hour to an hour and a half, and then we will open it up for questions. We have a website with the links and contact information of the presenters. We are ready to begin. Let's go ahead and welcome Chris Aher. Hi, Chris. Hi, and thank you, Mary. Happy to be on the line today. I'm going to go ahead and switch over to my screen here. Um, again, this is Chris Ahern from Dot Product, uh, and I'm going to be going through an introductory presentation on our technology and the Dot Product DPI-8 kit, which is the handheld 3D scanner being used by Alex and C Machines in conjunction with Rhino. So first off, a little bit about our company and the problem that we decided to solve with the DPI-8 kit. So we're a, a global company uh, based out of Boston, Houston, and also um, Wiesbaden, Germany. And we're a privately held company uh, with our three executive uh, officers shown uh, on the screen here. Raphael is the brains behind the technology. He really understands how computers understand the world, uh, a computer vision and augmented reality specialist. He's the developer behind our technology. Uh, Brian and Tom on the right are the ones who saw the application for this technology uh, in the 3D scanning world, engineering world, design world, and more. Uh, people who'd be willing to pay for a, a portable and uh, user-friendly device for instantaneous 3D capture. So the problem that we decided to solve uh, was the challenges of today's 3D capture solutions. Uh, they tend to be very expensive, uh, require a lot of expertise, miss occluded areas. Um, you know, you have to go back to fill in more detail, or some areas are just too hard to reach with the large-scale expensive solutions. They're time-consuming, uh, both in the field and in the post-processing, and not designed for the field uh, worker or the, or the mobile um, user. <laughs> So here comes our solution. The Dot Product DPI-8 kit is uh, uh, a complete all-in-one handheld 3D scanner that you can use to capture 3D uh, from a single-handed device all operating off of an Android tablet. As you see here, it's a component of three parts, the sensor itself, the tablet, and the core of what we do, which is called Phi 3D software. It's what pairs these two pieces of hardware and allows for the real-time accurate 3D data collection. So a quick list of the six um, things that we're solving with this device. So first off, it's truly mobile. You can walk around, reach hard to reach areas. Very simple to use, operating again off of a user-friendly Android tablet uh, with very simple software. And you can get up and running in two hours or less and get better and better the more you use it. Completely handheld, inexpensive at about $5,000 uh, for the total cost of, of everything needed to start scanning accurate and real-time. So as you'll see in some of Alex's videos, uh, there's a very powerful real-time feedback that you get not only while you're scanning, but you can actually view the data on the tablet within seconds of capturing your scan. A little bit more on the hardware before we get into some of the applications. Uh, this is the NVIDIA Shield tablet that powers everything from the processing to the battery life. It's uh, chosen for a reason. It's a very powerful tablet designed for gaming, and it works really well with powering our software and our sensor. The sensor itself is an RGB depth sensor sending out a pattern of infrared structured light and that is where it gathers the depth feedback 
and it also has an RGB camera in the middle that's stitching together uh, color data onto the depth point cloud in, in real time at 30 frames per second. The core of what we do, as I mentioned earlier, is the Phi 3D software itself, which pairs the, these two pieces of hardware and creates an all-in-one uh, solution. Uh, what we're getting out of the software is dimensionally accurate 3D, instantaneous reconstruction, as you can see in the video here, viewing your model right after capture on the tablet, real-time feedback in the green and yellow that you may have just seen and we'll see more of from Alex, so you know exactly how well you're capturing and what you have and have not captured actually while you're scanning. Real-time feedback um, and compressed output. So it's, it's an emailable file. Uh, we can actually scan and, and email right from the tablet, um, which anybody who's worked with point clouds before, they're traditionally very, very large files. But our files are usually somewhere between 10 and 35 megabytes. So it's uh, very small and easy to use both on the capture side and on the post-processing. Uh, and then lastly, you have the ability to append data sets together in the field. So you can go fill in gaps, you can uh, capture larger areas by linking, linking data on the fly, etc. So it's deliverable today with the DPI-8 kit, a complete solution that we calibrate and ship out of our Houston office. All software updates and support are included for 12 months which is important because, as I've mentioned, the core of what we develop is the software itself and we're upgrading it regularly. Detachable mount and protective case are included, and uh, the two accessories that it is compatible with are a mounted light kit, so you can capture full color data even in complete darkness with a diffuse light that is wider in field of view than the camera itself, and extension poles to, say, capture above the ground, etc. And that allows you to actually maintain control of the tablet in your hands while having the sensor extended um, at range. Software integration, first and foremost, we're integrating directly with Rhino via the free plugin, which you can find a link to uh, in the web page that Mary has already shared. And then here's several other programs who are also using our, our DP file format directly in both the point cloud and CAD worlds. We also export to industry standard point cloud formats to maximize compatibility with all the different 3D workflows out there and anything that will play with point clouds to any degree should work with our, with our product. Some of the professional features uh, that are very powerful with our device, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to append. So this comes into play in several different scenarios. If you see that real-time feedback, notice you didn't get as much detail on something as you thought you did or that you missed an occluded area that you hadn't realized during the scan, you can actually add directly back into that same file on the fly in the field. It's a very unique capability and a powerful application uh, for our users. You can also link multiple scans together on the fly. So you could, uh, without any sort of cloud-to-cloud -cloud post processing, capture, say, a whole floor of a house as opposed to just one room, where typically a single room would be one scan with our handheld scanner. You can link four, five, six, seven scans together um, using that method and capture larger areas when needed. Uh, you can also use targeting for the highest level of accuracy where we automatically recognized, recognized the April tag targets, which would be the one on the bottom here, which Alex will demonstrate a little bit during his presentation. Those are completely um, automatic improved accuracy uh, just by overlapping over these QR code looking targets during your scan. So there's no manual measurement. Uh, you don't need any coordinates or anything. It's a very powerful workflow to automatically improve the accuracy of each DPI-8 scan uh, with highly accurate loop closure and automatically recognized targets. Above, you'll see a more standard checkerboard target. We also play very well with these. If you want to take a set distance in your scan and specify uh, exactly how far apart uh, two points are, you can reference them that way. Or you can reference exact known coordinates, say, on a job site if you want to improve the accuracy and also reference it to a larger model, for example. All of that is an optional workflow that will just get you an even higher level of accuracy than you already achieved. Here's a long list of some of the growing applications for our technology. So everything from construction, um, BIM and as-built documentation, to utilities management, electrical, uh, building and facility management, and architecture, real estate, custom de design and installation. So going down this list, it's basically any scenario where either you're already working with 3D and you maybe are or are not experienced with point clouds, but also any scenario where you're replacing what would typically be at best uh, some complex measurements and some photographs um, and maybe a sketch pad. Uh, with this device, you can capture a lot more data 
in one visit and uh, just refer back to it whenever you need to pull additional measurements or fit um, modeling design into a, an existing scenario. Uh, as I move down the list, we also have crime scene and forensics, which is a very obvious application and a powerful tool for police departments today, archaeological documentation and digital heritage preservation. Uh, but this is just the beginning, so this list continues to grow as uh, the world of 3D continues to grow. So next I'm just going to go through uh, several slides of some current applications for our products and some images of the data that's been captured by our customers today. So this example is from a submarine pier uh, documenting the exact hookups in, in three dimensions to ensure that everything fits as needed for the U.S. Navy. Next you see an offshore facility modification on an oil rig in the North Sea. Uh, and this, this represents a lot of where our, where our technology comes into place. So you're designing a new system uh, in your CAD model, but you want to get some quick, reliable data of what is actually out there and how it's actually going to fit into the as-built conditions, which are often hard to obtain, different than they were on the original model that you had, and sometimes with very limited access to the site, which is, of course, the case with an offshore oil rig where it needs to be shut down and is very expensive for every minute on site. So they were able to capture all the existing space with the DPI-8 and then draw their model directly into the real as-built conditions. Installation verification is very common as well. So similar to the last one, however, this is a simple uh, bathroom renovation of a dormitory, and they were ordering prefab piping systems in bulk for every bathroom in this, uh, I believe it was a 10-story dorm, and they wanted to verify that the systems they were ordering in bulk were going to actually fit the way they were supposed to uh, before placing the order. So the uh, Pepper Construction actually went on site to the prefab facility, scanned um, the prefab system, and then brought it back into their model uh, to do all of that verification uh, before ordering with this is a pretty unique application here on a bridge renovation project here in Boston uh, with Skanska. And what they're doing here is using our DPI-8 SR kit. I should mention there are actually two different variations of the product. And the only difference there is a slightly different version of the sensor. So the standard unit will go from about 2 to 12 feet in range. And the SR kit will let you go from about 1 to 6 feet in range. So it doesn't have quite the same versatility. But if you know you're going to be getting you know, those more close-up objects or parts um, exclusively, then it allows you to get in a little bit closer, get a little bit finer detail on the data. So in this project, they're replacing steel base plates on a very old bridge that's being retrofitted. And there were thousands of plates, each one with very different uh, unique uh, rivet hole locations uh, for the replacement plates. So instead of having somebody climb up there with a harness, tape measure and a sketch pad to jot down notes. They're actually able to use the range pole and uh, keep the men on the ground and capture much more accurate, reliable data where they could then bring it directly into the design environment and draw their new plates right on top of the point cloud in three dimensions. So it's an application, save them a lot of time, money, and save Electrical utility management from underground vaults to uh, above ground interior systems. Um, this has been a very uh, growing uh, market for us and real estate. So uh, especially on the real estate management and renovation side, um, we've got a lot of customers working in custom installations and real estate development. Here's an example of a full six bedroom house captured with our device. This is uh, a large scale project for our device, but it's a, a very powerful tool. And this is all done using the append feature that I mentioned earlier. Historical documentation, uh, it's a very valuable application for preserving three-dimensional uh, color data of, of historic sites. Forensic reconstruction, as I mentioned earlier, so this goes for both accident reconstruction and interior crime scene reconstruction. And then on the bottom left here, the idea of, of using point clouds directly with um, models in order to reconstruct the, uh, the crime scene. And cast molding. So this is a more discrete example of, of capturing a quick scan with the DPI-8 SR kit to get those exact measurements of, of a leg. Uh, and then you send that directly to your design environment where you're going to be making that mold. And lastly, just a few more images to show the, the widespread range of, of where our technology is being used from automobile to, um, you know, something more uh, on, toward the consumer side of things, capturing a teddy bear, a dinosaur, and then of course a kitchen renovation project in the bottom right here. 
So in summary, why the DPI-8 and Phi3D? It's very easy to use, quickly deployable, a fully real-time tool, as I know I've mentioned a few times. It's a low-cost solution, uh, both on the equipment itself and the implementation. It's very easy to bring directly into your existing workflows, both in the field and in your um, post-processing environment. It plugs directly into your existing workflows and has a very easy upgrade path. So that's my rapid-fire overview of what we do and some of our technology and its applications today. But most importantly now, I'm going to pass it off to Alex, who's going to show us some of the, his live capture and how he's using the data directly in Rhino today. So my name is Alex Warman. I'm the CCO of uh, Steam Machines Robotics. We're, we're based in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts here. We, uh, we build systems and integration packages for unmanned surface vehicles, so very simply drone boats. We use Rhino every day from our conceptual renderings to our uh, design and intent to our um, as-built and construction drawings for our prototype boat that we keep here in East Boston. Here on our cover image, that is actually Rhino as Flamingo. If anyone's interested, we've spent a lot of time on Wave. So just a brief bit about the machines. Our autonomous control system, ACS, uh, has a system architecture that we can uh, deal with direct operations with a remote control. We can deal with other boats, so a fleet operation style scenario where you have multiple vessels collaborating together, some of which are manned, some of which are not, and it provides for much safer, uh, more efficient, and uh, more reliable operations at sea. For our completely remote operations, we can drive our systems by satellite. Really, any, uh, any system that can give us an IP link, we can use. Our, our system is more or less cost, except for our software, obviously, but we use uh, high-strength PLCs to do our most of our control and actuation. So we did have our naval architects come up with a couple of uh, autonomous hulls in order to show people the future. Once we start integrating into, into existing boats, we can integrate into new boats and allow them to be optimized for unmanned operations. This is a 20-foot by 8-foot, so it's containerable. A uh, very small, very high power workboat that we that was designed in Rhino, and these these uh, screenshots are out of Flamingo. So if anyone is interested in one of these boats, please give me a shout. We can make make that happen. Um, but we'll be focusing today on our uh, autonomous control system retrofit onto our V0. We call it. So this in the bottom left, you can see it's a um, 24 foot steel workboat that. Uh, we purchased in Holland and had it imported because it's uh, this interesting uh, drive arrangement. As you can see on the bottom right, it's a dual azimuth stern drive, which is a, a fairly interesting drive arrangement that's not particularly common in the U.S. That's why we bought it in Europe. And as you can see in the main image here, we've had to retrofit this boat with our control boxes, wiring, cable looms, cable trays, and in mass for our radar and hemisphere and our lighting system. And it's that math we're going to talk about today, although we have used the DPI-8 uh, in a couple of other scenarios, including hanging upside down in our stern locker, imaging the inside of the hull. So just briefly, a little bit more about sea machines before we dive straight into Rhino. We, uh, our original concept was collaboration and an oil spill response here, where you have an unmanned boat working with a, uh, a larger vessel to tow oil boom across the, uh, the surface of the water. And it allows uh, workers to stay out of danger because anyone who's been around crude oil knows it's not super fun. So, they can, so workers can stay safely on the enclosed bridge of the, uh, the supply vessel. And you can use the autonomous boat that does not require birthing, food, or, or continuous training to uh, stay, stay ready. You can use that and just deploy it whenever ready. Um, we have we looked at unmanned firefighting again. This is a uh, a use where you couldn't get human uh, drivers in that close, and you could potentially stop a fire before it became a large fire. Uh, we've not actually built any of these, but it is a decent concept. And we've uh, we've looked at remote USB ROV collaboration, where we would launch an ROV from our from our vehicle, and where we looked to demo this from our V0 actually quite shortly. And we're going to work with a company out of Maryland to do that. Uh, again, all of these renders are Flamingo. The water is, uh, is Flamingo water that we spent a great deal of time customizing. Uh, we've also looked at remote data harvesting. A lot of systems 
uh, subsea have more and more data and more and more uh, subsea communications in the field, and so now we're looking at bringing that back up to the up to top side. So that's a quick overview of sea machines itself. As you can see, we're going to be looking at the mass. So for purposes of expedience, we're going to uh, show a little bit about scanning our hull to get an as built. And if you'll all bear with me, we have a quick video, and I hope you all can see it. Uh, Mary will pass around the link to the video in case any of you have a, a slower connection or getting any problems with the webinar connection, and then you can watch it either right now, later, or both. So this is scanning the mast in situ on the boat. As you can see, we've installed the mast, and it has been pivoted back so we could fit the boat into our shop. I will say that one of the limitations of the DPI-8 is it doesn't do fantastically well in bright sunshine, and that's a, a hardware limitation. It's nothing to do with the design at, um, at the product. So we had to fold this mask down and get it in our shop. We had to scan it like this, which as you can see is, is challenging and it can be tricky to see the data. Um, so we'll show actually scanning it uh, with the scanner in real time. So again, this is, this is scanning in real time, showing uh, moving around the the, uh, the mast, and you can see it's kind of a pain to scan because a the access is poor, but b it's a tubular object, so it's not just flat faces. So this is actually me scanning scanning the mast handheld, moving around our boat, trying not to put my feet into the bilges, etc. And then the uh, the video actually cuts out because of Premiere Pro's rendering. But if you want to see the rest of the time lapse, it will be posted online and not be a problem. So this is that scan data from that scan after optimization on the tablet. Um, so you can see it really does capture the tubes and it captures the uh, the light mast itself. So again, a very challenging situation to actually see good data and a you know, real mix of materials. That mast, I, I was very impressed with the DPI-8. That mast is a highly reflective sort of car paint style material. And it really captured it well because it was able to see other objects surrounding it, so it didn't just discount the data. Uh, it's a, but it was a reflective, reflective thing. It did not scan well, so we can see this fit. And now, just for comparison purposes, I just switch on the um, the as design mast, so we can start to see from this point cloud that it really wasn't built anywhere close to what was designed. The, Pipes are sort of in the right place. The angles aren't really correct. The side walls here are really just completely wrong. Uh, and this is why we're going to allow our fabricator to, to go through this anonymously. And I did a quick scan of, of, our, um, of our mast. I'll just see if I can yank it up real quick. So anyway, you can see that it's, it's wrong here. And we had to do a little bit of steel rework on the hinges to get it to fit. You can see right here that the hinges don't really go where they were meant to. But now we have gotten it sorted out. It works very well. We were just out the other day uh, testing the radar and the GPS feeds in Boston Harbor, and the mast stayed on and fit well. And when we had to hold on to it due to bashing waves, it didn't fall down. So all of these are good things, and we, uh, we really think that the uh, DPI-8 has helped us out tremendously. We did do a couple of other works with our stern azimuth gears, just scanning the insides of lockers, hanging upside down, which was uh, certainly interesting. Now, just real quick, I'll go through opening a DPI-8 file. So let's just open the raw scan of that mask. So you literally you can just drop and drag or hit open, whichever you prefer. Nope, we don't change that. That's fine. You see here it's going to go through the frame to open it. Now, the uh, obviously, the orientation of this needs a little work. That's okay. All of you, I'm sure, are used to doing that right now. So before optimization, you can see there's a, there's doubling. There's a couple of artifacts flying around. And then after optimization, it's really much, much better. So this is after in-tablet optimization, and it returns it to really engineering and verification level things that uh, we can we can use easily. So that's that's how we've used the DPI-8, uh, and we, again, feel like it's, it's been an invaluable tool to us, especially to, just on this one project. 
and I hope we can answer any questions. I'll, I'll hand it back to Mary and, and Chris, but I hope I can answer any questions from a technical Rhino side. I'm sure Chris can, but if any of you have them from a uh, product side. Fantastic. Thanks uh, a lot, Alex. And uh, we can uh, ask uh, anybody to raise your hand if you have a, a question or a comment for, uh, for Alex or Chris. I have a, a couple questions in the uh, question pane. And uh, John asks, what resolution is the data captured at? and as in distance between points? Sure, uh, I can definitely answer that. The, um, the resolution is approximately one to two millimeters between points. Um, and the accuracy, um, it, you can always tighten it using the workflow that I mentioned earlier and maintain this across larger distances, but it is uh, typically about a five millimeter level of accuracy. Um, and it can actually be even better on the small scale stuff. The, uh, bridge renovation project that I showed earlier with the steel base plates on our short range scanner, they were able to uh, get more accurate measurements at a sixteenth of an inch tolerance uh, than they were with uh, hand measurements. So that's a pretty good representation of the best they can do. <clears throat> Is uh, five, does five millimeters, does that get any better with the use of the April tags or the uh, checkerboard pattern? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned, the resolution is about a millimeter um, and uh, the accuracy in a single frame can be as low as two millimeters. So using April tags or hard targeting or scale bar targeting is going to maintain that across uh, frames and across distance um, and, and keep it as tight as possible. So the more that you use, the higher accuracy it's going to be. <laughs> And one of the questions that, uh, that I had, we'll see if uh, anybody um, wants to raise your hand and, and uh, give us uh, any additional questions. I guess most of these uh, were related to uh, accuracy, but I was um, looking for some type of calibration process um, yes, absolutely. So that's the first question we get from a lot of people seeing the technology for the first time is, you know, are you using some sort of GPS or how are you keeping the data scaled? Um, and the, the, the way that that's all happening is built directly into our software and it's all based off of the geometry in the scene and stitching every frame together on the fly. Um, and basically, <clears throat> Um, it's not using anything outside of the device. Everything is local. Uh, there's no GPS, no Wi-Fi, um, nothing else involved. But it understands its own lo location in relation to the environment that you're capturing. And that's how it keeps everything scaled. Um, as I've mentioned a couple times, we have those scale bar workflows where you can take a hand measurement and say, I know that exact distance. I want everything to be automatically referenced to that hard distance. Uh, and that'll always make things even more reliable and even more accurate. Um, uh, same goes for the April tags, which we recommend just about every time because there is no manual input required for that other than just putting them in the scene and overlapping them uh, either at the beginning and the end of the scan or, or periodically throughout the scan. Um, all those workflows make it even more reliable and accurate, but in general, this is the scaled nature of the data uh, just comes from the way that we capture it and stitch it together on the fly. So there is no calibration needed other than what we do to the hardware itself before it ships. The, the specifics um, of the accuracy, I just wanted to say it's 1.8 millimeters at a, at a one meter distance. So that's right along the lines of the one to two that I mentioned earlier. Um, and that's the, the point spacing itself. <laughs> Great, great uh, details, uh, Chris. Thank you. And uh, Alex, how long have you been using the uh, dot product scanner in your work? I, I've used it, I don't know, for about eight to nine months now, something like that, for, for various uh, projects within sea machines. Uh, you know, retrofitting a steel boat obviously has a lot of fabrication jobs, so we've done more than one with it. This was just the one we chose to show. So I've used it consistently for that and a couple of my own projects, and so far it's been absolutely stellar. For Alex, is it hard to to uh, go back and uh, try working without it? Absolutely, yeah. I uh, I would now use it for almost anything over a tape measure, where where you know it's not literally a ruler, 
and I, you know, it, it allows me to capture data and then measure things after the fact I didn't even know I was looking to measure. But I've got a scan of something, I can then just look on my computer while I'm designing something, rather than having to go back in the water or go back somewhere else and, and measure it. Uh, it's, uh, it is really an invaluable tool. We do keep it in, it in its hard case in our workshop ready for use. And do you travel with? Uh, I haven't had the need to simply because our fabrication has not moved off site. Okay. But it's it's a uh, it's the size of a you know a large hardback book with the uh, the Pelican box, and, and it's waterproof. So I you, I could very easily throw it in the back of a truck, work truck, not a problem at all. And take it with. Okay. Thank you, Alex. And um, Garth says uh, has a question. Chris, probably for you, are the sensors available or in development that will have higher accuracy than the two millimeters approximately that you mentioned? Um, yes, there are. Um, and, uh, you know, as we are primarily a software company, that's something we're always open to and, and under current development with. Um, and, and, yeah, so we, we are working on both you know, improved accuracy, but also um, the daylight capability, uh, which is a current limitation, as Alex mentioned, where um, you can capture outdoors. You know, that bridge project is all outdoors, but it has to be early morning, late evening, in the shade or on a cloudy day, so it doesn't work in direct sunlight. So that's another limitation on the hardware side that, that we're looking to solve soon as well, um, uh, along with the, the accuracy limitations current. I saw a couple other questions from Joel, um, you know, is it possible to register with the DPI-8 scans with more traditional tripod scanners? And it's definitely yes. Um, it's a very common workflow for us. Um, we're partnering with a lot of the tripod scanning companies directly, and even with those we haven't, we export to those industry standard formats. So um, we go into, uh, you know, other programs like Autodesk Recap with a free plugin, like mentioned, uh, with that's just a point cloud processing tool, so that could be a good gateway into any program like Rhino or others. And, uh, and then we use those standard point cloud formats to work with, you know, any other point cloud you get from a different scanner or anything along those lines. Okay, great. And there's a few more uh, questions uh, that are coming in. Uh, is it possible to get a 2D image from the scan? Absolutely. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of slicing through the data. That's something that you can do in various programs. I can't speak to um, the exact capabilities of, of Rhino as, 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 as well myself, but I know that's a very regular workflow for our customers and you just can you know, scale down the 3D data to exactly what you want. Um, as Alex mentioned, we have some new software coming out uh, as soon as next week in beta uh, that will also be operating directly on the tablet or on uh, Windows. And that will allow you to perform some uh, cropping of the data uh, before you even leave the field. So um, it could be very helpful to crop down to a 2D, essentially a 2D scan uh, even before you leave the tablet and then that would be a, a very, very small file and make things really easy. Um, so that's all coming soon in beta for our customers, uh, but we're adding more and more to what you can do. So when you bring it into Rhino, all you have is the, the data that you need. You don't have any of those stray points or, uh, or anything else like that, so it makes it really easy. Um, another, another one I noticed okay. here was asking about um, annual calibration. Um, it, we do offer uh, an uh, annual or, or biannual calibration for the device to send it back into us, uh, but it's really just a matter of how often you use it and how often you hopefully do not bang it around. Um, but if that is the case, uh, we will recalibrate the device. But it's not a set uh, amount of time that is required. It's just a matter of uh, checking your measurements and if if you're not. Uh, within your specs, then you can send it back for recalibration, but it, it should last for at least a year, if not longer, um, as long as you don't bang it around too much. But it comes in a protective carrying case and is a very compact solution, so it's not a problem. Did you say uh, Houston is where the calibration, recalibration would correct. take place? Yep. So okay. That's where we do all of our assembly uh, production and, and calibration. And this might be something that, uh, a question that Alex can jump in at, and then we're going to unmute Garth's mic, and then he can ask his additional questions about uh, the tape. Uh, Nick's question has to do with file size and whether Alex finds that the point clouds are unmanageable in, uh, in Rhino. 
at least for what you're doing, Alex? Absolutely not. No, they. I, and I, I, I see where the question is coming from. Traditional point clouds, a lot of the laser time of flight scanners, you get gigabyte files, and they are absolutely horrible to deal with. I've worked with those in the field before, and they're terrible. So that scan that I showed of the mast in situ optimized was 16 megabytes in its native .dp format. So that's really small. Again, that's emailable. Um, once you bring it into Rhino, it, it does expand a little bit. It expanded that Rhino file about 375 megs. But in, with Rhino 5, without the uh, 4 gig RAM limit, I've never bumped into a problem. Uh, I've, I've even, you know, had multiple scans together. It's it's been no problems at all, and vastly easier than working with some of the multi gigabyte point cloud uh, outputs from other scanners. Um, so, how much RAM do you have on your system, Alex? I, I personally run a 32 gig of RAM system, okay. but my system my system's built for other things. Any reasonable machine that runs Rhino should not have a problem with this. Okay, got it. And it sounds like you do some video editing. You mentioned Premiere is another product that you run. Yeah, I, I my computer is vastly overbuilt for most of what I do. <laughs> okay. uh, Nice. It's a good situation to be in. Okay. Indeed it is. <laughs> Garth, uh, Garth uh, I'm going to uh, unmute your uh, phone here so we can get your question uh, about the tag. Hi, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to know if the tags needed to be perfectly flat, like on a wall or on a floor, if you can uh, like wrap it around a pipe, something like that. Uh, they should be perfectly flat, um, so you can stick it to a pipe, but you should, uh, you know, even just put it on a piece of cardboard and stick it to a pipe. Um, it will work, uh, you know, wrapped to a pipe, but for the most reliable results, we've been told from our developers that it should be a flat surface. Okay. Also, uh, it may have been answered, but what's the maximum scan volume, or uh, like how long can you run a scan? Sure. Um, it's it's. The best way to describe it is probably on the lines of 20 to 25 feet um, by 20 to 25 feet if you're talking in a square area, um, but you can go longer distances, for example, but it's usually about the size of a single room uh, is, is fair description of one scan, and then you can use a pen to link further and further from there. Uh, using what we call the spider method where you scan the center of your area of interest and then go out from there. So. The, uh, the PowerPoint sh showed a, a, a two-story house, and that was all captured basically by capturing the staircase first, and then doing uh, multiple appends back to that staircase to capture each room, uh, living living area, etc., um, as an append. And how many how many can you append together? There is no limit technically, um, but the the limitation comes in in wanting to maintain the accuracy of the data. Because if you append to an append and append to an append, then you know what could be, uh, you know, a couple millimeters of error can can grow. Um, so basically, what I just described there was a 13 scan append, where everything was back to that same central scan, um, and that's pretty much as far as you would want to go. Um, although you technically could go further, it wouldn't be as reliable. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Garth, for those questions. Yeah, sure. One more thing I wanted to mention is, uh, you know, as we mentioned in the presentation as well, um, you know, the core investment is in the software. So if, if we do come out with a, a more powerful sensor, for example, or as we already have in the last year or so, come out with a more powerful tablet, uh, we have affordable upgrade paths for the hardware. It's not like you have to buy an entirely new DPI-8 kit every time something like that happens. So it's uh, the value is in the software. And then uh, I also saw a question on that note about the support and maintenance, uh, the 12 months that did in the purchase price. Um, so that is a subscription. Uh, so you get your first 12 months of all upgrades, support, and maintenance included. And then if you want to stay on upgrades and support after that, it is a $700 a year renewal. Um, uh, but obviously, whether you renew or not, it's it's not uh, going to turn off your device. It's just to, to stay up to date on upgrades, which are a pretty powerful feature. I was going to say, I see there's one question here from, from Shari about um, mesh models. So just to clarify, the, the UI of the DPI-8 itself has a meshing engine built in to look at the model more coherently on the tablet. You can actually toggle that between just viewing points and viewing the complete mesh that it's built. 
it outputs a DP file which is just points. So you would need to mesh it. And, and Chris, do do stop me if I'm speaking incorrectly, but the meshing would be best done in Rhino with a meshing plugin if that's the route you wanted to go. I've not personally found that meshing a point cloud is particularly productive in what I'm doing. I find having the points there is, is much easier to work with. Sure, and I, I can speak to that as well um, in that uh, there are multiple programs that will read, you know, not only our DP file format, but our other point cloud exports and turn it into a mesh, including Rhino with a plugin, um, which I have tested. But uh, as Alex mentioned, uh, the power in point cloud data you realize is oftentimes not creating a mesh, but using it as a reference uh, to your design of other parts uh, and fittings or as a starting point to build your design around. Um, and that's when the point cloud is very useful, even not in a mesh format, but it will match the same as any other scan data if that's what you want to do with it. And uh, Chris, what other formats read the DP, or what other programs read the DP file? Sure, so um, I'll actually uh, chat the link here, but um, on our website, you can go to Software Partners, and that shows every program that reads the DP format directly to date. I believe it is about um, 20 or so, um, so far, and we're trying to get as many programs as possible to implement it, as it is, um, like I said, very small, fast, and easy to use. So here's the link, if anybody wants to click there, that will show you uh, the exact and current and if you have the DP file, can you save off a PTS file or, or some other standard format? Yes, that's no problem. So it exports to PTS, PTX, PLY, PTG, E57, VR con converter. And the question that I think I saw in the thread earlier might have been referring to our, um, our new both on and off tablet application .3D, which is coming out in beta. And that will also in the near future allow you to uh, say, bring your DP files onto the desktop or Windows-based device and then export your PTS from there. So um, a lot of the, you know, if you want to maximize your scan time in the field, even the optimization, which you can do immediately, uh, you can also save that so you're back in the office too, uh, whether on tablet or off with our new program. So that's all coming very, very soon. Do you have uh, a reseller of dot .product in France? Uh, we do, and our, our resellers are also listed directly on our website, but uh, we'll, we'll also be sure to follow up directly um, with Philippe for any discussions there. And uh, one of the uh, questions I think you've already answered, but I thought it was interesting uh, to hear because we didn't get into it in the PowerPoint was the uh, spider technique. So yeah, and that, that's important to mention when using the append feature. Um, of course, the first function for that feature is to fill in data actually into the same file, add more detail, fill in an area you missed, which is powerful in itself. But if you are using the append feature to link multiple scans together on the fly um, without using targeting and capture a larger area, um, then you basically just think about it quick and you capture the centermost area of your scan first and then append multiple data sets directly back to that. And that'll, that'll allow you to capture much larger areas without stretching out the risk of, of losing your accuracy um, too much. So it was a, a very easy workflow to capture, uh, actually a six bedroom house uh, hmm. with every append going back to that staircase. Uh, so that's kind of how that worked. Nice, okay, great, uh, great example. And uh, as far as I can tell, uh, I think we have made it through the uh, question list. If you don't see anything else uh, out there, Alex or Chris, that you want to comment on. Uh, I'll quickly just mention the, the very last question here is a coming soon uh, additional partnership um, with InfiPoints, and that goes to the meshing question as well. Um, that's an on-tablet software coming soon uh, from our partners at Elysium. And the idea there is that you could export directly from the tablet some recognized surfaces and, and pipes um, to bring into your modeling environment. Uh, you know, not, not just a point cloud for those who may want to, to bring those surfaces in. So that's something that's coming soon um, and uh, it's, it's under development uh, from the Elysium. Okay, well maybe we'll uh, do another webinar when that is available so that we Sounds can, uh, yeah, 
have some time here with uh, our uh, Rhino users and uh, dot product users. So uh, let's um, just uh, ask Alex and Chris to uh, make any final uh, comments or closing comments that uh, you want to leave our attendees. Well, I'd just like to thank everybody for taking the time today and please feel free to follow up directly. Uh, visit our website and, and then we'll be in touch with some follow-up information. Also happy to provide sample data um, of different industries uh, so you can plug it into your own workflow and, and see how it all works. Um, but thanks for your time and we'll be in touch. I just want to echo that as well. Thank you all for attending. I hope it was at least moderately interesting and informative and we answered all the questions. If anyone wants to be in touch with me directly, either about our, our robotic boats or about using Rhino in the field, uh, obviously don't don't hesitate. My email is on the uh, on the slides. We'll be posting the full versions of those videos, obviously without the black frames that Premiere decided to render. Uh, we'll be posting those online, and Mary will be sending an email out with those, which is very kind of her. So thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. That's great. Thanks, uh, Alex and uh, and Chris. So let's go ahead and move uh, into closing. I have the links also up on uh, the final screen. And I want to uh, thank Chris and Alex for their time preparing this presentation and for sharing their expertise with this powerful device. And on behalf of everyone here at Robert McNeil, we want to thank them for their generosity. And also thank you for spending part of your morning with us. Hope you found the information helpful and interesting. And we'll look forward to seeing you again in a future presentation. Have a great day.